It's mine. My own. My precious. Today we're going to employ some dubious tactics that may be a little dishonorable to prevent our neighbor empires in Stellaris from ever rising to be a great threat. We're going to be looking at a hive-minded civilization that spreads out like a fungus amongst the stars to claim key strategic systems and prevent them from falling into the wrong hands. With absolutely no further ado, I present to you Dry rot is a pernicious problem you should definitely do something about. Today, we're going to be making use of the brand new Stargazers to become a dry rot infestation throughout the entire galaxy. This is one of the new civics you can get with Stellaris First Contact, and it is one of four civics that allows us to start with a different type of FTL than normal. Additionally, we'll get a whole bunch of other bonuses and whatnot that are going to allow us to steal lots and lots of systems in key strategic locations across the galaxy. Not only that, but it has a whole host of other bonuses associated with it. First off, you will start with not one, but two science ships, not called science ships, but instead called exploration vessels. These are in a lot of ways better because they're half the price. The same is true with the engineering vessels as well. These three ships, instead of having regular hyperdrives, now have subspace drives, which are basically like a form of jump drive with a smaller range. However, they cannot make use of regular hyperdrive travel at all at the start of the game. We will also be getting the Stargazer trait, which I'll look at in just a moment. That trait is absolutely fantastic and absolutely free. In essence, the way we're paying for it is by having 10 fewer pops than normal and a reduction in our technological level and less infrastructure when the game starts. These are definitely large challenges to overcome. Having 10 fewer pops than normal is absolutely diabolical. But we're going to try and make up for that through clever use of strategy and tactics. Additionally, and this is where we have some real power with this build, we begin with intel on our starting cluster, meaning we get to know the disposition of these stars around us and which ones have habitable planets. That is great for early exploration and colonization. And on top of that, we will get plus one sensor range and plus two ship hyperlane detection range. That plus one sensor range is particularly spicy because it will allow us to do something rather naughty with our exploration vessels. And finally, we will get minus 20% starbase influence distance cost. Now that doesn't sound like much, but when you see what we're about to combine it with, you might just lose your mind. Do bear in mind that this civic cannot be added or removed after the game has started, and that is something of a pain. Basically what we're paying for here is the exploration, a fantastic trait, and cheaper ships that have a unique FTL type. We're paying for that with not only a civic slot, but also an economic disadvantage at the start. We're going to be combining this with the fantastic slingshot to the star's origin. I say fantastic, it's pretty low down on my origin tier list, but in this case, it is going to be absolutely amazing. You see, it's going to start us with a ruined quantum catapult near our home system and the technology needed to repair and use it. I generally might not even bother repairing that ruined quantum catapult until year 3540, maybe even something beyond that. That's not the main bonus we're going to be getting from this origin. Oh no, no, no. New star bases built in remote systems cost 75% less influence. Hold on a minute. When we combine that 75% less influence reduction, with the Stargazer trait giving us star base influence distance cost of minus 20%, we're going to get a combined minus 95% influence cost from distance, which means we can put a star base anywhere and it will still be only a few more influence than a star base adjacent to our capital. This means our land grab is completely unlimited. Just like dry rot, we can spread up from almost anywhere in the galaxy and build outposts and steal systems from almost anywhere else. It's very pervasive. Yes, our quantum catapult will be more accurate and we'll also get the quantic ambush bonus when we catapult our fleets going to give us plus 50% fire rate, which is really, really good. But even if you don't complete the ruined quantum catapult very early, these bonuses from the star base influence cost reduction 
and we're going to get an extra 150 influence when we take the ruined quantum catapult system are going to be absolutely amazing. Jumping back to our civics again, I'm going to recommend you take Cordyceptic drones. Now, first off, there is a little bit of an issue here. It says we're going to start the game with three reanimated amoebas. In the current patch, which is 3.7.3, .3, I want to say, you do not get any reanimated amoebas. However, I've spoken to the devs, apparently this is a mistake, and we should in fact be getting our reanimated amoebas. I don't know exactly when it will be coming, but I'm hopeful it will be coming with patch 3.7.4 relatively soon. Having three starting amoebas is going to boost our start considerably, given that Stargazer means we start with absolutely no military ships of any capacity and we don't even have corvette technology meaning we cannot build them. The other bonuses Cordyceptic Drones is going to give us is that when we defeat organic space fauna, that is space amoeba, Tianki and the like, we'll be able to automatically reanimate them. They will then be our ships to use on our side and they will get plus 50% space fauna weapon damage and plus 50% space fauna weapon attack speed. Not only that, we can of course, when we complete the salvage projects, get our hands on space fauna weapons as well to put on our ships. But we're going to be using this Cordyceptic drones along with our unique exploration abilities and massively reduced influence costs to very quickly and calmly scout out pretty much as much of the galaxy as we can in an attempt to find the space fauna home systems and take them for ourselves, thus giving us automatic and repeated fleet production every five years for each of those home systems we can grab. It's going to be very, very tasty. We are, of course, a hive mind. Now that's going to give us some good bonuses, plus 25% pop growth speed, which we absolutely need, given we have 10 fewer pops at the start of the game than regular empires, and minus 25% empire size effect, which we're also going to find very, very useful because we're going to be going over our empire size cap of 100 and getting penalties really, really quickly, okay? It's gonna be frighteningly fast. But how do we deal with the fact we've got 10 fuel pops? Yes, I said we're getting plus 25% pop growth, but are there other bonuses we can take into account? Well, I would definitely recommend you take the incubators trait. This is available to anyone with Stellaris Toxoids, and it's going to give us a whopping plus 30% pop growth speed on our initial colonies, and on our capital world, we're going to get around plus 16 or plus 17% because the more pops we have, the lower and lower the additional pop growth we get until in the mid 30s, it begins to go negative. But given we start with so few pops, this will not be a problem for us at all. And later on when it becomes a problem, well, we're probably going to genetically ascend and then we can mod out this incubator trait. Below that, you can see nomadic. Now nomadic is a trait I would never normally use most of the time it's hard to get a relevant bonus from this. It gives us plus 15% pop growth from immigration and minus 25% resettlement cost. With this build, resettlement is going to be something you'll be doing quite a lot of. And on top of that, pop growth from immigration is going to be quite a nice bonus to have in addition. Why is that? Well, it's going to stack very nicely with the Stargazer trade. Yes, this is a free trait, let me say that again. This is a free trait. It costs zero points because we've taken that delicious civic. It grants us plus 25% pop growth from immigration, minus 25% resettlement cost, and a whopping plus 10% habitability. This is the equivalent of taking nomadic for one point and adaptive for two more points. And even then, that three point combination is still slightly worse than the zero point stargazer trait. It is going to help us massively with what we're going to need to do as the game goes on. Finally, of course, throw in Unruly because Empire size from Pops, who cares? And Phototrophic because we're going to want to reduce our food usage at the start of the game and increase, yes, I've said it, I've said it, please don't shoot me, increase food production. So replacing food upkeep with energy upkeep will help us get our Empire going faster than ever. Now, when it comes to Cordyceptic drones, you could actually swap in for something else. Having Cordyceptic, I believe, is going to be very useful, but something like Ascetic is never going to let you down. Reduced pop amenities usage or increased habitability could be very nice. And if you're playing a more aggressive version of this build, that actually might be what you want. And if you're wanting to go down that aggressive path, I'm thinking that respecking hard into adaptability, throwing out Nomadic, 
grabbing fleeting and pushing into adaptive for a total of plus 10, plus 20, plus 25% habitability right out of the gate will be useful if we're attempting to steal the guaranteed habitable worlds of our neighbors. Yes, you heard me right. If our intention is to steal the guaranteed habitable worlds of our neighbors. <laughs> But for now, let's look at the slightly less aggressive version that starts with Cordyceptic. And if you're enjoying this video, please gaze up at the guiding star of YouTube, that like button. When you dive in, there are a few things that you should notice. The first off is that you have absolutely no mining bases in your starting system. You're going to have a bunch of five energy and five mineral deposits. Now, the first thing I think you should do with your minerals at this point is start by building mining stations first on the five minerals, then the five energy. The reason I say that is when we come to look at our planet and our pops, we are lacking quite a bit. With only 23 pops, you're going to find it quite hard to produce much of anything. But there are a few things we can do right out of the gate. First up, I'm going to recommend you fully employ your agri drones or farmers. This is going to boost your food income as much as possible. Dropping down a maintenance drone to go in slightly negative amenities will still keep us above 50% stability. And then we also want to max out our tech drones as well. You're going to actually find Unity production right at the start something of a challenge. So getting rid of the Hunter Seeker drone right away, I don't believe is actually the right call because that reduces our Unity income by 10%. When looking at our research, grabbing research labs straight away and trying to find research deposits around us that we can use to increase our meager, meager research income will be very, very important to get this research lab researched as quickly as possible. Otherwise, hydroponics farming is going to be the next technology you should take even before planetary plexus. Not unlocking the hive core building on the sentinel post will actually be completely irrelevant to you at this point, because you're going to get this building anyway, even if you don't actually have it researched. Finally, military will be necessary in order to defend your new conquests. I mean, additions to your collection, and you should take Corvette. Here we get information on our starting cluster. We've got something of a cul-de-sac here, which is fine. We've got some guaranteed habitable worlds, and I'll start by surveying one of them. But with our other exploration ship, it's now time to begin exploring. I don't have to pay any attention to the Hyperlane network. In fact, I could completely turn it off. And from there, I can just choose where I want to go in the galaxy. Welcome back to Stellaris 1.0, ladies and gentlemen. It's taken six years and we've had to pay for it, but we've gone full circle back to where we started. <laughs> Every time you jump, it will then take 150 days or five months before you can initiate jump again. You can, in the meantime, begin surveying a system you're in. Just don't forget to use that jump again within 150 days to go somewhere else. Also, bear in mind that we've got additional sensor range. So when we jump in, we're actually going to get information for not just the system we've jumped to, but all of the adjacent systems via hyperlane. For that reason, you should probably keep the hyperlane map mode turned on and keep jumping to new systems to maximize your network coverage and see new things. We are looking for a number of things as we jump around the galaxy. As I've mentioned before, we're looking for Tiana Vec, the home system of the Tianki space whales. This one is probably the best to find, first off, because they are passive against you, so you can easily take it, and then you'll get access to a whole host of extra research points, which are going to be very, very useful to you. But also, once you have this system, you can build the special starbase building a cordyceptic reanimation facility. This facility will produce a reanimated fleet every five years when built in Tiana Vec, Tian Oort, or Amor Alvio. Definitely also keep an eye out for the Helito system. It will spawn in every game and that will give you access to Dacha. And in Dacha, we'll find the Solar Punk Empire, which will in the end give us a Gaia world as long as we play our cards right. Keep an eye out for all of the guaranteed systems to spawn like Wenkwert and Wenkwert Artem because you will have the exploration ability to get there and it will cost you 
absolutely nothing extra in relative terms to take that system for yourself. Otherwise, you should buy enough food that we can get to 500 food within six months. That will allow us to begin building our first colony ship as soon as possible. In this case, if you set up your planet, as I've shown earlier, you can buy 25 food and run down your energy credits for that first six months with absolutely no problems. Why is that going to be possible? Well, all of your starting ships cost half the number of alloys. Yes, your exploration vessels, your engineering vessels, and your colonization vessels all cost half of the normal alloy cost for ships of this class. That is going to make expansion much, much faster for us. With our first colony ship well underway, we're going to ease back a bit on buying all of that food and try to save up some energy credits so that we can remove this collapsed burrow from our capital. That is going to give us extra pops, which we so desperately need even to work the basic jobs we have at our disposal from the start of the game. I've now jumped here to Uqualon, and I found exactly what we're looking for. When you find another Empire's capital, and at this early stage, basically any planet they have, unless they're an advanced Empire, is going to be their capital, you'll want to check out what preference these aliens have. In this case, we can tell their tropical preference mainly because the Empire Capital is a tropical world. So what we need to do is we need to look for all of the other tropical worlds around them and survey and take those systems as fast as possible. That's the evilest thing I can imagine! At two jumps away, we probably don't need to worry about that one straight away. I'm actually looking more at the systems adjacent to the capital in case there's a tropical world there that we should take as soon as possible. Just as I suspected, there's a tropical world here that we can take. So we're going to want to survey this system quietly and calmly. That way they hopefully won't notice us and then jump in a construction ship and snatch it from them. Now in a PVP game, it's unlikely you're going to get away with capturing one of the guaranteed habitables if they're right next to another player's capital. However, if you can manage it, you should absolutely try and do it. Do bear in mind that at any time, if your ship is in trouble, you can click the return button and every single ship in our fleet will be able to go into emergency FTL and then missing in action because we don't have hyperdrives. So you are never in any danger of having any of your ships killed because you can click the return button, go missing in action, and that will be before any ship is able to attack yours. I'm now going to build another engineering vessel and another exploration vessel, which I won't even be getting a scientist for because that's something I'm going to show off for you. When it comes to our traditions, I have two recommendations. The first is that we take prosperity and take prefabricated buildings. That is going to help us by reducing all of our building costs and getting our buildings up a bit faster. However, because we won't actually be building any buildings right from the get-go, it's going to be a little bit of time before any of our colonies are ready or we actually have enough pops that we want to move them from basic jobs up to something else. I am currently recommending you take expansion and take one mind. Now, spawning Frenzy, for the cost it will be, probably isn't worth it. Given we already have a net of plus 55% pop speed growth on our colonies right from the get-go, this is actually only an effective 6 or 7% increase on our overall pop growth rate for pop growth. But having one mind and doubling the number of pops all of our colonies start with is going to be very beneficial given I'm going to recommend you build somewhere in the region of four colony ships at least at the start of the game. You see, what we can do with this exploration vessel, even without a leader assigned, is we can explore. Because of our bonuses to sensors, even without a scientist, we are going to get view on adjacent systems when we jump. This means you can use a second exploration vessel like this to back up the work done by a first. Don't forget to start building another colony ship once you get to 500 food again, but do bear in mind that 100 alloy cost. You see, in this case, I do want to steal this tropical world from our neighbors 
as soon as I can. And actually, I won't quite make it. It's a shame, but they've gotten their first. I'm just going to have to make do with their second guaranteed habitable here in the YAML system. By also taking Jamor over here and then beginning the first contact procedure, I will be able to close borders and lock these aliens in with only one or two planets. If you can do this as many times as possible, you're going to create some really, really stunted empires around you. Pretty much the first building I'd recommend you build is a sensorium site on your capital, followed by an alloy foundries. You are going to want to increase your pops first and also clear your collapsed burrows before you do, but this is going to mean you can get rid of your hunter seeker drone and move a maintenance drone over to unity and maintenance production, which is going to be more efficient for you. And because of all this expansion, having two more drones producing alloys early on is very, very useful. Also, don't be afraid to move your scientists around from one ship to an empty ship you've got in position ready to survey. This way you don't have to wait for a science ship to move around. In this case, that would have taken 300 days to get to Jamal because I've already got a ship ready to go. As your colonies come online, you're going to get your hands on Synapse drones, which will boost your Unity production yet further. And this should stave off the Unity drought we had from the start of the game. Otherwise, the first building on at least one or two of your worlds should be a spawning pool. We want that to increase our pop growth. And pop growth will not be an issue for you when you look at how much the dry rot can spread. Here we have our first colony that showed promise and we are getting plus nine points of pop growth every month. 25% growth from hive mind, 30% from incubators. We are at a whopping 90% habitability due to stargazer. And in addition, we're getting immigration from our capital that is being multiplied by 40% from our bonuses, turning 3.3 migration or 3.3 capital pop growth into 4.6 pop growth on this external world. Once our pop grows, if we don't have a job for it, we can simply spend 50 energy and five unity to resettle it back to our capital where we will almost certainly have work as we build industrial districts, increase our basic resources, and finally start pushing out research labs. Around year five or so, once you have another industrial district up and running, it's time to switch on fortify the border and begin upgrading outposts to starports. This is going to be an economic imperative for your nation. Once we have our starports up and going, we're going to put solar panel networks on them to boost our energy income and also hydroponics farms to boost our food income. Don't forget to put down a research lab on your capital don't forget to keep building exploration vessels, putting scientists on them and sending them out into the galaxy so we can explore as much as possible. Once we get up to five star bases, you'll still be wanting more for the economic benefits you will need. For that reason, simply grabbing unyielding just to get your hands on that plus two starbase capacity and the juicy plus 50% starbase upgrade speed will be very useful. Switch back after that into finishing prosperity and when you do, we are of course going to take executive vigor in order to max out the edicts we can use. Other worlds outside your first three should only really be used for the pop growth and immigration potential. And then you should force the pops to resettle back to a planet where you can put them to use, specifically like your capital. As we start getting our spaceborne economy up and running around year 10 to 15, you can probably start switching over to a manufacturing focus. And additionally, replacing the agriculture districts on your capital with things like industrial districts. Due to the bonuses you get from Hive Capital, it's probably best you end up turning your capital into something of an all-rounder with a specific focus on alloy production if possible. One of your first colonies should probably turn into a mining world and the other should be focused more towards research. If you really play your cards right and grab just the right worlds in just the right order, you can lock in empires and keep them stuck down to just a single planet or possibly two. This means by the mid game, they should be very easy pickings when you're starting to look for vassals or conquest opportunities. With this build, if you play it correctly as well and grab lots and lots of juicy, juicy worlds with nice pop growth, you'll actually have no issues when it comes to pops whatsoever. Here I am at year 23, my alloy income isn't amazing, but I am making a decent amount of research, about 100 of each, and I am about to hit 100 pops. 
Yes, you can completely overcome the early negatives of this start with this build. And as long as you make use of cordyceptics and find places like Tiana Vec, you'll also have very few issues when it comes to fleet later on. Though do be aware, you will almost certainly be at a technological disadvantage compared to your neighbors and rivals. You could also take a slightly different route with a Stargazer hive mind, and instead of going for slingshot to the stars, go for a necrophage start, and I'm going to assume you'll probably be abusing a whole bunch of primitives. I need to say a big thank you to Ragoon for his help with this build and this video, and if you'd like to check out a video by Ragoon on the Stargazer Civic, check out a link down in the description below. If you've enjoyed this video looking at a stargazing hive mind with a slingshot to the stars origin, and you'd like to know my thoughts on all of the rest of the origins in Stellaris, click the video on screen now.